Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I'm Dr. Rhys Grant and I am the Science Communication Specialist here in the Biochemistry Department, shared also with the Cell and Molecular Biology Programme at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre at Cambridge University. So I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to our department this afternoon for this live talk as part of the 2021 Cambridge Festival, which aims to tell you about some of the exciting research being undertaken in Cambridge. So for this talk, I am joined by Dr. Amanda Chaplin, who is a postdoctoral researcher in our department. And today, Amanda is going to be speaking to us about how scientists can use electrons to image and obtain 3D pictures of biological molecules, like proteins and DNA, that may help us to understand how our bodies work. I'm also joined, as always, by Latika Segumba, who's part of our department's secretariat team. And Latika is going to be helping me out behind the scenes today with the running of this online event. But before we get to hear anything about cryo-electron microscopy, the first thing we would like you all to please do is to click the subscribe button down below to follow our YouTube channel, because we've had loads of talks over this last week or so for the Cambridge Festival, and these are all still available online through our channel. And we're also planning on bringing you more live content direct from our department in the near future. We'd also encourage you all to please check out our other social media channels on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, using our handle, which is at CAMBIOCHEM. So that's C-A-M-B-I-O-C-H-E-M, because we use these channels to tell you about all of our news, our research, our teaching, events, outreach, everything really that goes on in our department in Cambridge. I also just want to let you know that after Amanda's talk, Amanda, Latika, and myself will be taking part in a live question and answer session. So if you have any questions on Amanda's talk, or perhaps if you'd just like to ask something more general about cryo-electron microscopy, if you could please post your questions in the live chat on YouTube, and then the three of us will stay for 15, 20 minutes or so after Amanda's talk to answer as many of your questions as we can get through. If you do choose to participate in the Q&A session, you don't need to worry about being seen on camera or heard though, because it will just be me reading your questions out anonymously on your behalf. So as I've mentioned, uh, so this afternoon's talk is going to be given by Dr. Amanda Chaplin, who is a postdoctoral researcher in our department in the research group of Professor Sir Tom Blundell. So Amanda completed her undergraduate degree and her PhD at the University of Essex in the UK, where she was working on proteins that are involved in the antibiotic producing bacteria Streptomyces. Amanda has now been in Cambridge for two and a half years, and she's currently using cryo-electron microscopy to understand the process of DNA repair in humans. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Amanda to start this afternoon's talk. So thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you, Rhys. Uh, hello, yes, so uh, I'm Amanda Chaplin, and as we said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Cambridge University, and my research area is on DNA repair, but I've been using the technique called cryo-electron microscopy um, to look at uh, proteins involved in DNA repair. And so today I'm gonna to tell you more about cryo-EM, and this is basically very high powered uh, microscopes where we can look at detailed structures of proteins, DNA and cells. And so the aims of my talk are going to be that I'm going to give you an introduction to what proteins are, uh, what they do and why they're so important to us as humans. I'll then explain the basics of how cryo electron microscopes work and I'll be shorthanding this to cryo EM. And then I'll give you two case studies of when we've used cryo-EM and how we've answered biological questions. And so one of these is something you've probably all heard of or should have done, uh, which is COVID-19. And the other one is DNA repair, which is my research area that I've been working on over the past two and a half years. So I'm very sorry to start uh, my talk with a picture of myself, um, but this is just to represent uh, a human body. And so we all come in different shapes and sizes. But uh, what is common is we're all made up of cells and animals are as well, and also plants. And so cells are the basic building blocks of all living things. And a human is composed of trillions of these cells. 
And this is just a, a very rough drawing that I've done of a cell here. Um, and cells have many parts to them, each with different functions. So this is a, a representation. The purple area is a nucleus, which contains your DNA and your genetic material. And there's also things called ribosomes, which actually make your proteins, which I'll tell you more about in, in a few slides time. And so, as I mentioned, though, uh, proteins and DNA are present within your cells, and these are extremely complicated molecules, but they're essential for life. So, so why are proteins so important and, and what are their functions and, and what, why do they help us as humans? So just to give you some uh, examples of these, some of what I thought were quite important ones in the human body. Uh, so the first one is hemoglobin. And this is present in your red blood cells. And what hemoglobin does as a protein is it picks up uh, oxygen as you breathe it in, in your lungs, and then it delivers it around your body to um, all your different cells. And then it picks up carbon dioxide, takes it back to your lungs, and then you breathe it out. So hemoglobin is very important for respiration and for living and for, for processing of all our cells in our body. Um, some other interesting ones or interesting proteins are actin and myosin, and uh, these proteins act together to use energy to be able to contract our muscles. And this is just an image of what a muscle fiber may look like. And, and so actin and myosin are very important in movement of the human body. Uh, rhodopsin is a protein which is actually present at the back of your eye, uh, at the retina. And this is very important in visualization under dim light conditions. So that's very important for us being able to, to see properly. And insulin, which is a hormone, um, and this is actually the structure of uh, what an insulin protein looks like. And this is important in regulating uh, blood glucose levels. So all these proteins are, are very, very important for the function in humans, but, but how are they actually made? So I'm just gonna now go through some basics of how we go from, first of all, your DNA and how that is actually translated and transcribed into a protein. So DNA is your genetic material and the code for DNA is ATGC. And the specific sequence of this will then help and encode for your specific protein. And how it does this is that it's first of all transcribed into something called RNA. And RNA is very similar to DNA, except the genetic code is slightly different, that this U has replaced the T. So the genetic, genetic code is AUGC. And your RNA is then translated into proteins. Uh, and proteins are actually made up of 20 letters, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. So DNA is made into RNA, which then is encoding proteins. And this is all done inside your cells by something called a ribosome. And this is where RNA comes along and then it can make your protein as shown here. So this is your ribosome uh, in green. And these proteins are helping for the translation into, um, into your protein. So the 20 letters, as I spoke about, these are actually amino acids and we have 20 of these. And the way in which they are com combined and the combination of them makes different proteins and therefore the specific proteins have their specific functions. So just to give you a very bit of basic about uh, amino acids. So this is a, a general amino acid uh, structure and it has a carboxyl group on one side, the COOH, and on the other side is an amino group, this NH2. And this R group here, this is what changes in the 20 different amino acids. So this is just showing all 20 here, but you won't probably be able to see them in detail. Um, but these are the 20 functional side chains, this R group here. And they change based on their size. So you can get smaller or bigger side chains, or they can be more acidic or more basic. So they can have different kind of uh, properties. And the way in which they're combined to make a sequence of, of protein then determines what kind of protein you will get and, and what it functions as. So whether it's hemoglobin binding oxygen or actin and myosin contracting your muscle cells. Um, so to give you a kind of simplified representation of this, say if pink was a particular amino acid, um, if you had a pink amino acid and then a green and then a blue and then a yellow, then a purple, that may make protein A. Whereas if you have a pink amino acid, then a blue rather than a green, then a green, then a yellow, then a purple, that makes protein B. So the actual sequence of these particular amino acids determines what kind of protein you have. And as scientists, it's very important for us to be able to visualize these. We want to see what our proteins actually look like, what the amino acids look like, and this can help us understand what the function is in the body and also help us with designing drugs to target these in, in particular medicines. So how can we visualize proteins? So with the human eye, you can visualize each other, you can visualize objects, um, you could even visualize a brain if it wasn't actually inside your body. 
Um, but to be able to visualize in greater detail, you may have heard of light microscopes and you may have used these in schools. And this uses light, which is a source of energy and has a wavelength and, and packet of photon, which we can actually then reflect off these particular cells and organelles to look at a little bit more detail. Um, but what I'm talking about today is electron microscopy and electrons, because they're shorter wavelength and have a higher energy, allow us to actually visualize protein structures and amino acids. And so there are other techniques such as X-ray crystallography, NMR, which you can visualize proteins and, and amino acids as well, which has been spoken about by other colleagues of mine uh, earlier in the week in the Cambridge Science Festival. But today I'm going to be telling you about electron microscopes and why we can use this to visualize proteins. So just to give you a little bit of history. So the first microscope was invented in the 1600s. Electron microscopes were about 300 years later than this. And cryo electron microscopes, and the cryo just means cold, uh, is since the 1980s. And so commercial microscopes are available since the 1930s. But the biggest problem was that because it's ionizing radiation from the electrons, it would actually cause a lot of damage to your sample. So it was only then in 1984, where a European team actually discovered this method of cooling your sample and cooling the microscope to be able to uh, actually retain and not damage your sample so you could get better structures of your proteins. And this is then really where Cryrian started to kick off and, and has been just kind of going up and up and up since then. And this led actually to the resolution revolution. Uh, and this was a lot of work done by these three men, uh, Jacques Dubosche, Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson. And Richard Henderson is actually working at the LMB in Cambridge. And they received the Nobel Prize in 2017 for their work in improving the resolution. And so what do I mean by improving resolution? So before the resolution revolution, so before these three men did a lot of work to try and improve cryo-EM, uh, the structure of your protein may look something like this, where it's just kind of a blob, you can't really define anything, you don't know exactly what it, what it can do and, and what its function may be. Now with the resolution revolution, you can start to get greater and greater detail until we're actually looking at these amino acids that I said about, and you can start to see individual amino acids and how they're playing a role in the protein. And so what's contributed to the resolution revolution? Um, and I'll just go through some basics here, but I'll tell you a bit more about that in a, in a few slides time, was firstly sample preparation. So as I said, making sure the sample is cold is very, very important for, for stability and, and not damaging the sample. Uh, computational, so to, to actually process your data. And we have these, uh, there's lots of different ways to process it um, and software called Relyon CryoSpark. And we use this to process our software and to get our structures. Um, electron microscopes themselves. So we now have very high voltage electron microscopes and detectors. Um, and these are now increased in sensitivity. And so we can actually detect the electrons a lot better. And this can then help us with determining our protein structures. So this is just to show generally what uh, electron microscope looks like. So I've just put on here a few, a few things about the microscope and I haven't gone into a huge amount of detail, but we start off with a high voltage around 200 or 300 kilovolts. And we have an electron gun, which fires the electrons down this central column here. And we have our sample or specimen, which is containing our protein in the middle. And the electrons then hit our sample before finally they're actually detected at the bottom here. And unlike a light microscope where you'd actually look at it using your eye, we actually need a special type of fluorescent screen or camera to be able to detect the electrons as they go through our sample before we can then process it. So that was what um, a cryo actually looks like in, in a textbook. But what do they actually look like uh, in everyday life? So we here in the Department of Biochemistry have two types of um, electron microscopes, a larger one and a smaller one. And this is the larger one called the Titan Cryos. Um, and it looks just a bit like a black box, to be honest. Um, but I have a short clip here from Steve Hardwick, who works in the Cryo-EM facility. And I'll just show you this now. What he's doing is he's loading some samples into uh, a cryo-EM microscope. And this is the, the smaller one of the two, but you can see the detail in here. Um, and so he's loading the sample here. And then the specimen or sample protein will go into the electron beam, which is right down here, this big column. So it's fired down, hits your sample, and there's a detector right at the bottom there, which detects your sample. So what's the general workflow? What do we do to try and um, 
get structures of our protein. So we start with proteins in solution, and this can be by many different methods. Uh, you can extract it directly from, from uh, cells, or you can make the proteins. You then pipette them onto something called a cryo-EM grid, um, and these have lots and lots of squares all over them and can be made from different types of material. And then you rapidly freeze the sample in something called liquid ethane. And this is very, very cold and it rapidly freezes your protein and it creates a very thin layer of ice. You can then put your sample into the cryorium and then collect lots and lots of images of it. And use, uh, then you use um, computing software power to process your data before finally you can get some kind of map and model of your protein structure. And so I'm just gonna show you here, this is Lee Cooper. He works in the cryo facility here in Cambridge as well. And I just thought it might be quite nice for you to see how we actually freeze our protein samples. So this is a vitrobot, this big thing here. And what Lee's doing and what he's showing you is he's picking up a very tiny grid, cryo grid on these tweezers. He's checking that uh, it's secure. And then he's attaching it to this vitrobot. Uh, and this vitrobot is actually controlled using a pedal underneath the bench that you can't see. So what he's doing is the, the cryo-EM grid is now being taken up into this central chamber, and this is humidity and temperature controlled. And now this pot here contains the liquid ethane, um, which he will now press the button and it will start to rise. And then what he'll do is he'll take a pipette and he's then gonna load his protein of interest. And this could be any protein really, or, or many different types of proteins that it could be. And he's now going to very carefully pipette it onto the cryo-EM grid. Uh, so you have to be quite delicate with this. And uh, sometimes it's quite easy just to hit the grid a little bit. So he's now applying it to uh, the grid. And then you can see the white piece of paper there. What that's going to do is block the grid once the protein's loaded, just to remove any kind of excess protein and then rapidly plunge it into um, the liquid ethane and what we call vitrifier. And once it's created this vitreous ice, we can then load it into the cryo-EM machine. And you can see as it quickly dunked down there and then it comes down and it gets stored very coldly before we actually go on to loading it into the cryo-EM machine. And so once you have your cryo-EM grid with your protein on it frozen, you can then look at it under a microscope. And what it looks like is it's lots of tiny little squares. And if you have nice ice, you can see lots of them individually. And if you zoom in on one of those squares, you see something like this, which has got lots and lots of holes. And these holes can change in diameter and thickness depending on the type of grid, which can be sometimes better or worse for certain proteins. And then you can look at one of those holes. And if you look at one of those holes, you can start to see your protein particles. And so we're looking here for very individual, nice uh, protein particles, as you can see here. But then once you actually have your protein particles, once you can visualize it, once it's been in the, the microscope, how do you go from these 2D images of your protein to actually building up a 3D reconstruction? And so I thought I'd use a little example for this. And uh, this is a guitar actually I brought during lockdown um, to try and encourage me to be musical. Um, I can say so far I've only learned happy birthday, but anyway, uh, so this is showing you 2D images of my guitar. It's the side, it's the front, the bottom, the back, and the other side. And to make a 3D image, what, what happens is that you, you combine all these 2D images together to make this 3D reconstruction. And so eventually you can then get a 3D image. And this is exactly what happens in our computers for when we're actually trying to get a protein structure. So what we have is our protein particles as shown here. And there's a type of software which picks all these protein particles individually. And you can then get 2D projections of them. This is just an example of one of the proteins I've been working on um, and all lots of different 2D uh, projections. And then from these, you can build up a 3D reconstruction. This is a slice through uh, a 3D image. And then eventually you can create something called a cryo-EM map. And so this map is just covering your entire protein. And if you then know the amino acid sequence of your protein, you can build into this map and then you can finally get a cryo-EM structure. So this is how it, it, it generally all works. Um, and so now that I've told you about how cryo-EM works, what proteins are, how can uh, this technique actually be used for some everyday um, kind of examples? And so the first example I thought would be very apt at the moment is COVID-19. So 
yes, I'm sure you've all heard of this. Um, and so this isn't my research area, but uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about some of the CryoEM work that's been done on uh, some of the proteins involved in uh, COVID-19 and why it's so important. So COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, okay? And you've probably seen this a lot in the news, but this is what maybe uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus does look like. Uh, and it's covered in these red spike proteins, okay, which is dotted all around the, the structure. And these red spike proteins are responsible for attachment to our cells, and that's how they affect us. So they're attachment to the host cell, which are ours, and, and that's how they cause infection. And then they create antibodies, um, and, and hopefully, you know, you can then fight any further infections. And this is how the vaccines work as well. They have DNA or RNA, which encodes for this spike protein. And then that helps us to elicit a immune response. And so if we get any infection, future infection with COVID-19, then we can fight it. So, so why is cryo-EM so important? So the structure of the spike protein was actually solved last year. And since then, there have been hundreds of cryo-EM structures of a lot of uh, the coronavirus uh, proteins involved. And this is really important because now we can actually see what the spike protein looks like. And that tells us a lot more about the function and the mechanism and, and can help us design drugs as well. And so you've probably heard in the news about lots of new variants of this spike protein. And this is you know, very important because it can even make it more transmissible, more infectious. And uh, what these mutations can do is they can either be protective um, so they can stop our antibodies actually binding to the virus and removing the virus from um, binding to the spike protein and removing the virus from, from the cells, or they can actually make the spike protein stickier. So it sticks to our cells and causes a high amount of uh, infection. And so if we get really good resolution of these using cryo-EM, we can start to see at the amino acid level, some of these changes or some of these surfaces. And this thing can tell us, you know, what's actually happening with the function of this particular protein and how we can then target it using different vaccines or different drugs. So uh, cryo-EM has been extremely important um, in the last few years, definitely in helping against the fight against coronavirus and COVID-19. And now just to go on to uh, my research area. So for the past two and a half years or so, I've been working on DNA repair. And so uh, you can get damage in your DNA. Uh, and this can be caused by lots of things like ionizing radiation, um, chemotherapeutics. And if your DNA is then not repaired correctly or it's mutated, it can cause cancer or diseases and aging. So DNA damage is, is very, very dangerous. And perhaps the most dangerous type of DNA damage is when you get a break across both strands of your DNA. And this is called a DNA double strand break. OK, um, and cryo has been really important because it's enabled us to look at a lot of the proteins that are involved in bringing these uh, the, the DNA back together again. And so this is just to show you very basically what happens is you get a break in your DNA. And this can be, as I said, caused by ionizing radiation, chemotherapeutics. And then there's various proteins, as shown here, which then bind onto your DNA. Um, I won't go into detail what they exactly are, but they then process, process the DNA ends. And then they allow us to bring the DNA back together again and become repaired. So if your DNA isn't repaired, this can cause cancer and aging and other things. So to understand exactly how these proteins are working is, is very, very important. And so I've been using cryo-EM as a technique, and, and this is just to show some of the uh, structures that I've obtained, some smaller proteins bound to DNA, uh, larger, more complicated ones. And this one's 4, 000, over 4,000 amino acids in length. And then how some of these proteins can actually bind together and form higher order assemblies. And we've started to find these really multi-component um, complexes, which are so important in bringing uh, the DNA together. And, and so we can put these all together now in a type of mechanism where we have certain proteins coming together, which start to assemble and then, and then more proteins start to come on. Um, so yeah, so the cryo-EM has really helped us to understand the function of, of DNA repair. Um, but we're still not completely clear yet. We've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, there's loads of proteins involved in DNA repair and this all happens inside your cells and it's, it's really, really complicated and takes us a long time to figure out exactly where and how these things are binding and, and why certain amino acids are just so important in forming the complexes. Um, and also then this can actually help us to design drugs 
um, and it can actually help us to inhibit certain processes and help with cancer therapies as well. So this is something that we're, we're looking into and, and maybe we can stop these processes at certain stages uh, to help uh, with cancer therapies and other things in the future. So I've just whizzed through that really, but um, I would really like to thank uh, Sir Tom Blundell, who's my supervisor at the moment and has been for the last few years, and the DNA repair team, uh, Tonya, who's a PhD student I've been working very closely with over the past few years. And thanks to the Cryo-M facility uh, in the biochemistry department. Um, they've set up now about three years or so, and it's been really helpful and really exciting trying to use this technique for um, understanding lots of different biological um, mechanisms and, and functions, to be honest. And um, I'm sure there'll be yeah, lots more exciting things in the future. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda. And thank you for taking the time to record those clips of how uh, the cryo-EM machine is used. They were really, really interesting. And at least from my perspective, I've never seen the cryo-EM in action. So that was, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so we're now going to have our live question and answer session. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you could please post these in the live chat on YouTube, uh, and then we'll try our best to answer as many of these as we can get through. There is a short delay between what we're saying on Zoom and you hearing us on YouTube though, uh, to say that we're not sitting in silence. Uh, that means I get to ask the first couple of questions. Um, so I guess my, my first question, Amanda, is how much does a cryo-EM machine cost? I'm guessing these are not cheap pieces of kits. <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah, they're, um, they're extremely expensive. Yeah, they are, that, that's a good question. How much do they actually cost? They're quite a few million, I believe. <laughs> um yeah they're extremely expensive we've got um two here in the department and um I, I believe they required a lot of funding and and help to be able to set them up and and you also have to have specific types of room for them so they have to be quite quite tall the buildings um and temperature controlled and um you also you don't want a lot of vibration when you're collecting the data so you have to make sure that um yeah you have a specific type of room and and also the vitrobot that I showed you um how to actually freeze the samples that that is also quite expensive so the whole thing is definitely isn't cheap um and you know the running costs as well so i think i'm very fortunate to have such good access to it um there are places such as like diamond uh where you can apply to to collect data and go there so um and i think lots more companies and, and universities are getting cryoem so it's something that i think will continue for the next few years at least yeah you can you can kind of tell they're expensive just from looking at them. I think anything that has <laughs> mood lighting, so the green lights and the purple lights, that those extra bits only come with expensive pieces of kit. Definitely, I think that adds to it, doesn't it? The mood lighting. <laughs> it does. It looks very futuristic, and it looks like a lot of fun to use. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Definitely, looking inside it. I mean, yeah, I've been using it for a few years, and I've never really properly looked inside until I helped with the video the other day. So um, yes, it's a, it is a nice piece of equipment, definitely. And um, so I guess going back to the sort of the fundamentals of cryo-EM then, um, my first question is, why can't we use visible light and light microscopes to image tiny things like proteins and individual molecules? Yeah. What stops us from using That's a good question. I mean, it's all to do with kind of the wavelength of light. So as we're kind of looking through our eyes, everything's kind of reflecting back to us. Um, and if you use visible light, it's like a certain wavelength and a certain energy, and it's kind of packaged into something called photons. Uh, and yeah, so to look at greater detail, I mean, we know it's there, but to actually have the wavelength and energy of light to be able to you know, penetrate it to then reflect back to us, um, we don't have the capabilities of doing that. So that's why uh, electrons are so good at that. They're just higher package, uh, higher energy particles where you can actually um, penetrate things which are much smaller. So um, yeah, there's other things as well like x-rays and um, yeah, so that's why you have to kind of use different types of uh, energies to be able to see such detail. And you mentioned when using electrons that um, in previous iterations of electron microscopy, the electrons would damage your samples. So what, what about the cooling process stops that damage from happening? Yeah, so the cooling process, I think, was really important in, in helping with cryo -EM. It definitely, it kind of, 
Yeah, it's it freezes the sample. So it stops it from any electrons that are hitting the molecules from actually, you know, causing more damage and ionizing radiation around it. So it just kind of almost you know, like stops the, the reaction, stops anything actually occurring. Um, and yeah, we call it something called vitreous ice. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the way it's frozen very, very rapidly uh, in something called liquid ethane. Um, which is, yes, very, very cold. Um, not quite as cold as uh, liquid nitrogen. So um, it's a, a way of the, the method that's been, you know, made over, over a few years to try and, yeah, freeze the protein sample so that it can't actually be damaged as such. Yeah, so it would be nice if you could do room temperature things, but <laughs> not at the moment. Um, Atika, did you have a question? I think you before the talk, we were talking about the freezing process. Yeah, um, I, just a bit more behind that, really. About the freezing process? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, it is very interesting. It's, um, so I think liquid ethane is about minus 180 degrees or something. Uh, whereas I believe liquid nitrogen is about 195, <laughs> something like that. Um, don't quote me on the numbers, but, um, yeah, the way it works is that we have like a little pot of liquid ethane in the middle of that kind of polystyrene box that you saw Lee was kind of putting onto the, the Vitrobot. Um, and on the outside is liquid nitrogen, keeping everything very, very cold. But then there's a little tiny pot of the liquid ethane. And that's then where the sample gets initially frozen into and makes this very amorphous uh, kind of vitreous ice of the protein. It makes a very thin layer of it. Um, and it's the way that the water molecules are kind of frozen so that it doesn't crystallize and doesn't make these kind of continuous uh, ice lattice, which can then, when it goes into the electron beam, this then gets absorbed and, and causes problems. So it, the way of freezing it is really important in, yeah, not just getting a load of ice crystals that are then going to affect your sample. Um, and the way it goes is you, you, it plunges into the liquid ethane and then you have to then very carefully, which I didn't show you in the video, transfer it into the liquid nitrogen. Mm. And the liquid nitrogen is just a lot uh, safer than liquid ethane. And it's a lot easier to kind of transport the grids and things. So you initially freeze it in the liquid ethane, transfer to the liquid nitrogen, and that's then how you store your grid. Um, and and uh, the, the microscopes are all stored under liquid nitrogen. So it's only the initial freezing, which is done in the ethane. So how come you wouldn't just use liquid nitrogen for the whole of this uh, process then? Yeah, so it's to do with the way it freezes. I think because it's so cold, I think it freezes too rapidly and then causes um, yeah, the water to form ice um, and a kind of a crystalline state. Um, so it's more that you need the liquid ethane, which is a little bit warmer, um, that it does freeze, but it freezes in this kind of we call it this vitreous way mm. um for the initial freezing anyway and then the rest of it can be done in liquid nitrogen then yeah Thanks. so it's like your, your goldilocks method for freezing <laughs> the liquid ethane is not too warm like a normal freezer <laughs> but not too <laughs> like liquid nitrogen yeah i think so and <laughs> um, there's a really uh, uh, there's a fantastic question on youtube which uh I'm, I'm hoping this person has seen our other structural biology <laughs> technique talks. Um, so someone's asking if there's any obvious, well, I'm gonna amend their question slightly. So they're asking if there's any disadvantages to using cryo-EM compared to other techniques. And, but then as a follow-up question, what are the advantages of using cryo-EM versus uh, say NMR and X-ray crystallography? Yeah, so yeah, so X-ray crystallography and NMR are brilliant techniques as well, and, and they've been used for, for many, many years. And it depends on, on what kind of protein sample you have. So I think with NMR is generally a lot better if it's kind of more of a disordered type of protein, um, slightly smaller. Cryo-EM generally is better for larger proteins, although it's getting better and better for smaller proteins as well. Um, I guess the, the benefits of cryo-EM <laughs> are that you don't have to make a crystal. So sometimes it's quite difficult to crystallize proteins, especially some of these big DNA repair proteins that I was working on. I would never have been able to crystallize them. Uh, it would have just been too difficult. Um, and also the amount of sample that you need. So for cryo-EM, it is very low consumption in sample. So you just use a few microliters and, and not a very high concentration. So that's definitely um, a, a benefit. Um, some of the, I guess some of the bad things are that 
we are a bit limited to size. So until fairly recently, we can only really go with quite big proteins. So now I think we're getting down to about 65 kilodalton size, um, but we can't go a lot smaller. I don't think at the moment with cryo-EM. So it's generally, it's, it's for bigger things, you know, like viruses, cells, like um, big complexes, uh, proteins, um, so NMR and crystallography, I think, are, are better for smaller things still at the moment and, and looking at uh, better resolution. But I mean, in the future, yeah, cryo-EM is definitely pushing towards getting higher resolution, more detail and also smaller proteins. So I think eventually it will get there, but it's still a little bit early. So, yeah. So I guess if we're sort of summing up across all our talks, then it seems X-ray crystallography is good if it can crystallize or you've got more of your sample available. Yeah. NMR is good if it's got floppy bits or it's <laughs> very small. And cryo-EM is good if it's a big thing and you've only got a little bit of your sample available. I'd say generally that's a good, <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good conclusion. <laughs> yeah. It's been very interesting having talks from three of our different structural biology uh, fields that are conducted within the department. It's nice to see how the differences and the similarities between each technique. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Um, so uh, you showed that you were using, uh, with your guitar, the two-dimensional images, and then a computer will merge these all into a, a three-dimensional picture. Mm. Um, how many two-dimensional images do you need to make a 3D? Oh, yes, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, yeah, so when we actually pick the protein particles as such, they can be anywhere in the region from about, I don't know, 20,000 protein particles up to a million. So yeah, we use special software that can actually pick these particles out. You can either do it manually by hand where you have to sit there with a big screen and, and look at these particles and just pick the them 20, out. The oh no, no, you don't need <laughs> You do it for, for, a, for a small subset first and then you'll then extend it. So manually, maybe for just um, a few hundred, maybe. <laughs> and then um, that would then be increased. Um, but we do have uh, lots of automated ways of doing it now. And the micrographs, yeah, there's a, there's a few hundred of those. So it's, it's quite a lot. Um, and then the 2D classes. So that all those protein particles will go into specific classes of 2D. And there can be... I don't know, anything from starting at about 100 different classes, um, and then you can start to narrow it down. So you start with maybe 100 2D projections of your moving particle. And um, I should say one of the problems with cryo-EM is sometimes you get your, your protein particle just in one dimension. So you just get it from kind of looking above rather than on the side. And that can be a bit of a problem when you're actually generating a, a, an image of it. Um, and then from there, from all those 2D classes, you can then pick out maybe five, which go into your final reconstruction. And, and that's then how it builds up. So yeah, it's, um, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, and you can collect data sets over, I don't know, like a day or a week. Um, and the longer you collect, the more particles you have, the better generally the resolution is of your, of your sample and uh, of your structure. So yeah, it takes a little while. There's lots of good it's kind of like, uh, it's software. Is it a bit like you're kind of taking an average then? So the more pictures you have, you're kind of averaging out any of the interference or whatever from the individual pictures. Yeah, yeah, that. definitely. No, it is. You're, you're exactly right. It's like an average. And you could in your protein sample have, you know, some of the smaller stuff on its own, some of the bigger stuff on its own. And then you could have the two proteins together. Um, so from one data set, you can get, you know, multiple structures. You don't necessarily just have to get one. So you could um, pick all the protein particles and say 10% goes into the small structure, you know, 50% in the other one and whatever in the rest. So, yeah, it is. It's like an average and, and you have to kind of, it's almost like a sorting process. You have to take all the particles and, and figure out, you know, what goes where and um, separate it out and get rid of all the junk and yeah, it's quite quite satisfying. <laughs> I guess and, 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 like when you end up with such beautiful three dimensional reconstructions, it's going to be satisfying when you get that end product. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's sometimes frustrating, but. <laughs> <laughs> and how long does the whole process take? So, say tomorrow you decided to uh, image a new protein that you haven't done before. How long would it be before 
on in general before yeah. you get that? I mean, yeah, it kind of depends on how good your sample is. So uh, say if it's a really, really nice sample. So we had this recently with someone in our group who had a very nice protein. It was very symmetrical. Um, and so we'd freeze it, say, tomorrow. And if we got enough cryo EM time, we could collect in, you know, next week, um, collect the data. And then from collecting the data to processing it would maybe take five days or something. So it'd take a few weeks to go from freezing to collecting to then processing. Um, some software is a lot slower than others. So, um, yeah, some of the newer, well, some of the newer different software that we use now is starting to be a lot quicker. Um, but yeah, some of the more complicated data sets can take months, yeah, where you're trying to separate it out, trying different ways of trying to figure out what proteins are there and how they're binding and stuff. And um, and then a lot of the problems can be with trying to get nice protein particles. So sometimes you can end up with like too many and it can't pick them out properly, or you can end up with lots of aggregation and lots of bits of things all over there. And again, that's a problem. So um and also freezing you can end up with bad ice so it'd just be like a black screen <laughs> and I've had it before where you put it in the microscope and it's just black and you think oh gosh well <laughs> I'll have to go back to the you know <laughs> trying again so yeah there's there's lots of you know optimization and trial and error and some proteins are easier than others but but generally it's becoming really quick yeah um and definitely in the in the department here it's it's very quick so yeah it's quicker than I would have Yes, if I had to have a wild stab in the dark as to how long it would take, if it's a few weeks to a few months, that's quicker than I... Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a lot better, I think, than it used to be. But that's, I think, partly to do with getting time on a microscope. I think, yeah, I'm very lucky to have time here. But I think, um, yeah, other places you maybe have to wait a few months to get to get some time. So, yeah. And that's all the questions that I have. Um, I don't know, Latika, if you have any final questions that you wanted to ask or anything. Yeah, um, sort of going to the whole uh, DNA repair that you're doing. So I'm guessing, um, so you mentioned that it could be used in sort of like to prevent aging. So for me, I'd think, okay, I guess cosmetics would be one of the number one things that a lot of people would end up thinking of. But so could it, in theory, be used to kind of stop us aging forever? Could we live forever with this sort of... Um, you know studying yeah. into it that's a really good question this is yeah the aging part of it I've started to look at kind of recently and haven't looked into it a huge amount but um yeah I believe like as you get older your DNA repair systems are just not as good and so you're just not repairing your DNA as, as well as you possibly could be I guess in theory if you had enough of these proteins and you knew at which points to add them or or how to make them work better there's no reason that you couldn't actually help with DNA repair and, and then, you know, help prevent aging. So there, maybe it's more complicated than that, but yeah. That, yeah, I definitely think there needs to be a bit more work done on uh, looking at these proteins in aging and, and DNA repair. And there's definitely ways that maybe we could target these proteins and, and learn more about them. Yeah. 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 Hopefully it won't lead to any kind of super villains as a, I think we've mentioned in the talks before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that wouldn't be good. <laughs> is it that they, the DNA repair enzymes with aging become less efficient or is it that there's more DNA damage that they can't cope with repairing at all? Oh, I, or think it's a mixture of both? I think it's probably a mixture of both. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think they probably, they definitely become less efficient. Uh, whether there's more DNA damage, yes, probably is. But I guess the cells are maybe not replicating. A lot of DNA damage can occur during replication. And that's usually when you're younger, actually. So you get a lot. Of, um, but then I guess over time also you're um, exposing yourself to more kind of radiation or bad lifestyles, which can cause more DNA damage. So I guess over time it's like accumulating <laughs> that you could, yeah, be causing more DNA damage and your DNA repair system is not quite as efficient. Yeah. So probably a combination. Content for a future talk for next year's <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. uh, I think we are, we're out of time now, actually, anyway. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much uh, again, Amanda, for a fantastic talk. And I really loved your films. Thank you again for recording those for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also, Latika, for helping me out behind the scenes again. No problem. Cool. 
Uh, and I also just want to say thank you very much again to all of our speakers from this week for the Cambridge Festival, because this is unfortunately it's our last uh, live talk. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for the nine interesting talks over the last week. And thank you to all of you at home for watching this talk. Um, so hopefully we'll see you again soon when we bring you more live content from our department. So stay safe. Have a nice